lot of fish here. And one thing I, I keep going back to is the amount of work it takes to keep these fed, fat, and happy. Um, there's been a couple of times that you've uh, mentioned waterfers and the different kinds of food. I really want you to kind of lead me through that because that's a totally different area of this that I think deserves to be talked about. Here we are in a totally different section of the operation where Bob grows things that aren't fish. And um, I'm going to have him explain that. They're in these buckets that you see. And so I'm, I'm curious, about why, why are these buckets covered with sheets? We have the plastic right here so it doesn't get cross-contaminated. If any of this water over here, when they're doing maintenance, splashed into the system, we can crash it. So, okay, so this is different yes. than that. Okay. Yeah, we got to keep this separate. That's the reason for this. If you look inside here, we have nine buckets of rotifers. You really can't see the rotifers without having a magnifying glass. You definitely won't see them in the bucket right here. But we have nine black buckets. And then behind this area over here, we have 18 more buckets, so five gallons each. Okay. And what do you do with this? We use this for the baby clownfish. This is their first food which they're going to eat for about the first eight days of their life. We also use this for a product that we make called reef stew, which is a coral food. Does, do the things in here exist in my reef tank? They are, since you're adding reef stew to your tank, they <laughs> definitely are in your tank, okay, Chad. But, but if someone isn't, they're, they're, it's a potluck. They may or may not have anything like this in their tank. No, they're not going to have the rotifers. They'll have the copepods and some of the other creatures that are in there, but they're not going to have rotifers okay. in the tank. So again, going back to the, the eggs I have, I, they're not going to survive in my tank because I don't have anything like this. That they're going to hatch and they're going to starve. When people ask, hey, my clownfish had babies, what do I do? The first answer is, if you don't have rotifers, you're not going to have baby clownfish. Okay. You have to learn how to grow rotifers before you learn how to hatch out and grow clownfish. So this is a completely different breeding operation. You're, you're taking care yes. of a completely different microscopic animal that the fish eat. you got to learn this first. And you got to feed these. These guys get fed every day, too, where they're eating algae. So it does no good for you to have a tank full of eggs if you don't have this. If you don't have this, you'll never have that. Okay, very, very interesting. Now you mentioned your other product, Reef Stew, and you mentioned that I use it, and I have used Reef Stew for probably at least 10 years, I guess now, um, since I discovered it. And I want you to show me you know, a little bit about that process. What's, what is Reef Stew and why do I care? Okay, it's a really good coral food. It's also good for fish. If you bring in some fish and you can't get them to eat, the Reef Stew is a real good product just to get them to start eating. It's great for corals, SPS and LPS coral. Can you tell us what's in it, or is it like a, a Colonel Sanders secret recipe? No, it's, um, there's different algae that are in it. We won't go into too much detail on that. But there's rotifers in it. I hatch out and I decapsulate brine shrimp, two different kinds, San Francisco strain and Great Lakes strain. And then we also bring in on this one live jumbo brine shrimp. We'll add that to it. We also add coca pots to it. So whatever kind of fish you have, they're going to find something to eat in reef stew. Yes. And the corals are also going to eat the, the, the algae, the microalgae, and maybe the rotifers? Yes, and then also a lot of times people will buy a mandarin fish, and the mandarins are very difficult to get them to eat frozen food. So unless your tank has a real good population of pods in it, the reef stew is going to be really good just to get them converted over to frozen food. And so let's say I take some reef stew and I put that in my tank. Um, will, will the copepods that are in your reef stew just all get eaten or will some actually stay in my system and create their own population? Some of them will stay in there. It just depends how many fish you have. If they can get into the rocks or whatever, they can multiply. But I mean, typically, if you've got a lot of fish in the system, they're going to go right for that. And this. So even, like for me, for example, I, uh, I just set up a new tank, and I set up the new tank with dry rock. So I didn't bring in any of those kind of things. One of the first things I did was buy some reef stew. I turned off all my pumps, turned off my skimmer, and put the reef stew in my refugio. That is really good. I mean, what we recommend, you can leave the pumps running, 
but don't turn off your protein skimmer for at least 10 minutes. Otherwise, your skimmer is going to pull that right into it. Okay, and that's a good that's good advice. And so for me, I use Rage 2 not just to feed my fish, but to spruce up the population of to get it started. Yeah, and it's a I have noticed every so often my tank will go on a downhill slide, and I will put more Rage 2 in, and it just really for me the it's visible to me what it does for my tank. My corals, the polyps will extend, and I see more of those things in there. So I recommend Reef Stew for people, not just for breeding pound fish. It's a, it's a separate product, right? Yes. Okay, so where, where if I want Reef Stew, where do I get it? We sell it, we ship it throughout the country, but we only sell to retail stores and people in the business. We don't sell to the public. If you're in the Phoenix area, we deliver to 14 retail stores. Oh, wow. 14 of them. In the Phoenix area. So if I am outside of the Phoenix area and I go to my local fish store and I want reef stew but they don't have it, how do I get it into their store? What do they? Do? They need to contact us, or you need to contact myself here with their information so I can contact them. Okay, and you'll work with them. And yes. You're not. You're not going to restrict in terms of retailers. If they if they want it, you'll ship it to them. Yes. Okay. And we do ship it throughout the country. But typically, a lot of the stores will only buy fish once a month, so that's when they're buying the reef stew. So it's okay. not going to be there every week. Okay. It goes into a reef stew, ends up in something that resembles this green stuff. And, and one of the things I want people to understand is don't be turned off by the green. Why? That is algae, but why isn't that going to be a problem to throw algae in your tank? Your tank needs algae. There's a lot of corals that need that to survive. Okay, so we're giving it something that's beneficial. Yes, it's beneficial for the corals, but also that's the food for the zooplankton in there to eat. The rotifers eat that, the brine shrimp eat that, and the pods eat that. So really, reef stew is a little miniature ecosystem. Pretty much. It's just one war going on in there, and they're all eating the algae. And Okay, very good. So I just want to show everybody, you can see that the reef stew is absolutely full of living organisms. Some of them you cannot see, and when I get back to the house, I'm going to take some reef stew and put it under my microscope and show you guys up close exactly what a rotifer is, because you can't see it with the naked eye, but I can show you okay. with my microscope. And uh, Bob, would you mind if I took a tiny bit home with me to put under the microscope? Absolutely. Awesome. And I'll show everybody what, what on earth we're talking about when we talk about rotifers. The fact that rotifers are a completely different breeding operation. Can you tell me a little bit about the life cycle of rotifers and pulp quads and, and those kind of things that we have? Well, the rotifers, which we have right over here, are the large strain. They typically only live about eight days, but after about day four, they start reproducing. And it's about every four to five hours, they're dropping baby rotifers. Wow, so you have to constantly keep up on the food for them too, right? Well, we have to feed these every day, and we need to harvest a certain amount every day, which we are doing. We need these baby rotifers for the clownfish fry. This is their first food. And then also what we do, we incorporate a water change on this on reef stew day. On the day when we make reef stew, we'll do about a 50% water change on here and add new water to the system. And so reef stew, you don't do it every day, and that's, it, it's something that has to be fresh? Yes. We do the reef stew once a week. We take orders for that on Wednesday, and we make it Thursday morning and deliver it or ship it out during the week. So for the aquarist who's looking for it, their best bet is to get it as soon as they can. Yes, the weekend is typically the best time to get it is on the weekend. It'll last over a week, but then I'm feeding it when I have it over here. Okay, very good. Hey everybody, this is Chad. What you're looking at here is a microscopic view of reef stew. It's one of the things that took me longer to produce this video than the other ones in the series is that I decided to put reef stew under the microscope. Now I'm not going to say that I know what everything you're looking at is. Uh, there are some things that I recognize and some that I don't. Um, but I think it's interesting. What we're looking at here is some algae. 
and you can see there are things moving around inside of it. If we look a little bit closer, especially right in the middle of the screen, you'll see a little creature moving around. And I can't tell you what those things are at this point. Uh, there are also some things that are in the shape of bars that I don't recognize. Here you see some larger things there, that little worm-like bar. I don't know what that is. And I don't know what the red thing is in the middle. So I can't identify that. And I'll, I'll maybe do a little more experimenting and digging down uh, to see. But you can see that at this level, reef stew is full of life. Um, so many things um, that we're talking about. What you see here is a brine shrimp cyst. It's a, the egg that a brine shrimp hatches out of. And you can see as small as that is, there are things small enough to live inside of it and eat from it. Everything gets eaten. Everything gets consumed. And everything has its life cycle. This is like a little miniature world. And another fascinating thing, you can see that the, the liquid that this is in, the salt water, it's moving. All these little creatures, all these little things create their own current. This is under a microscope slide with, with a, another slide on top of it to hold it together. So it's fascinating, there's very little thickness to this, yet all this lives within that realm. So you can see there are smaller things and bigger things that go on. Brine shrimp, which is again what that egg is from, are going to be the largest things that exist in reef stew. And this is a close-up of a brine shrimp. And you can very much see how his movement creates uh, the current that I was talking about. But you'll see he's not the only thing doing that. Now th there, uh, very fascinating. It's kind of stuck to the the end of, end of him. Um, stuck to the end of him there is the rotifer that you heard Bob talking about. That's one of them. We'll get a better look at him later. This one is um, probably literally stuck. I don't know if he's done so intentionally or not. As we go in close on the brine shrimp, this is his digestive tract, which is the dark thing in the middle. And I'm assuming that what we're seeing on the outside of that is actually his circulatory system. So that would be the equivalent of his bloodstream. And that's a guess, again, but it makes sense. We wouldn't have hemoglobin like you and I have to carry oxygen. So we wouldn't expect, expect to see uh, what you see in a, in a human body. But their, you know, their digestive system is obviously very rudimentary, um, just as is the digestive system of the rotifer. Um, in this case, he's eating poo right off the, right as it comes out of the uh, brine shrimp. Isn't that fascinating? So he's got kind of a internal jaw that he brings things in, munches it up, and it sends it through the alimentary canal right out the other side. And we'll pan up there's an interesting little feature of rotifers um, that I don't quite understand but it, it almost looks as if they're um, whether it's pooing or not I don't know or if he's if he's even laying eggs you can see here coming out of the the back end is this little uh, what you know what looks like an ovipositor but I have no idea what it really is it could just be the way that he defecates there, you see that? It, it looks like it's almost done with, with a definite movement. Now, you know, I had assumed that the the one end was the jaw end and, the, and that was the anus end uh, because it makes sense and you'll see in, in a little bit why. But anyway, it's just a, fa a fascinating movement. Again, all this is happening in your little bit of reef stew right so we've gone from the large the large brine shrimp I say large which is hilarious because you know obviously they're very very tiny and to get this view we're at quite a bit of magnification um, and then next below the brine shrimp in size is the copepod and that's what this little guy is and to me they have a, a prehistoric almost alien look to them they're very very unique and you can see um, almost insect like right 
almost like the, the larva of some dragonfly, but that's not. He has the same very simple rudimentary digestive system in one end out the other basically and uh, he's hard <laughs> he moves around a lot the brine ship you know they, they they move but not quite in this pattern so the copepod's very hard for me to to get right on uh, it's the interesting thing about you know looking at things in the microscope is that they're when they're alive like this they're not still specimens they're swimming around and so if you've ever used a microscope if you s move the slide just a little bit it cre it's what magnified distance it's like all of a sudden you've jumped miles uh, and this is an example of something that I, I don't know what it is so I don't know if it's uh, just a bit of something that's gotten on the slide um, or it's a, a you know a bit of um, bacteria that's clumped together I suspect that a lot of the things that we see are some form of bacteria um, things like this or probably algae it's very dense so it could be a, a piece of uh, something else um, there's a little copepod I, I brought our um, magnification out so you can get a better look at the whole creature but it's just fascinating to me I could look at these kind of things for a long time but you get the idea that when you see these things in, in your tank, these are the, the little white dots. I'm guessing that that is a molt or something, an appendage from something that's come off of a brine shrimp or whatever. So he's inter interacting that little hairball, which I, again, I don't know what it is. Um, but yeah, it, to the naked eye, what, what you're seeing here is a little white dot. I mean, it's al almost people you often see on the forums, what are these little white dots in my tank? this is the little white dot in your tank this is what a lot of your um, fish eat they'll they'll go and um, your mandarins that's their main thing this is interesting this is a the carcass of a looks like a little amphipod which is a another small creature that you'll you'll find in the reef stew um, or some kind of a pod but he's he's dead he's either dead or that's his molt but he's, it's being consumed. And again, I go back to the fact that this is a um, an ecosystem, right? We zoom out. Look how look at that. There's so much going on there. So much life. So much um, happening. And you can see it's all moving, right? It's got its own current, its own highways, its own way of doing things. You see the black dot in the middle where everything's moving around. Look at that current. So you would you know you saw the brine trip create the current but here we uh, here we have one of the, the the tiniest little things creating the current and it, you can see that they're pooping on us well not on us but <laughs> kind of we see it eat we see it digest we see see it poop and uh, so that's just a, an absolute amazing kind of fact that this something this small creates a current it's it's all on degrees so for you know the brine shrimp does its thing and then then the copepod does its thing and here you see the rotifer doing its thing which amazes me we talked about the current that's created by the brine shrimp and then another little current that's created by the copepod and now here's a little current created by the rotifer and he's, he's bringing things to him and and sucking them in for digestion he'll eat them up and poop them out the poop will be consumed by something else reef stew is a micro ecosystem with with things that are are living and breathing um, some things i don't know what they are this little guy is maybe a more complex algae looked like that has a green tint so maybe some chloroplast and some things so small that my microscope won't even bring them in so so many things anyway that's reef stew put it in your tank and it feeds everything um, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.